Battalion Landing Team 226, U.S. Marine Corps, Vietnam, 50-Year Remembrance. Discovering Margo, presented by Robert E. Widener of VFW Magazine. Robert Widener wrote a gripping account about the Battle of LZ Margo that takes you onto Margo's barren slopes as mortar fire raked the exposed Marines. But first, he had to discover that the battle took place at all. Rob's research for the VFW Magazine's book, Brutal Battles of Vietnam, led him to accounts of what the Marines of BLT-226 had endured on LZ Margo. Here he tells us what he discovered and adds details that he couldn't get into the book. When Al Green contacted me about this reunion, I just couldn't believe it. From one end to the other are men of the 2nd Battalion, 26 Marines who were at LZ Margo, 1968. You are some of the bravest men I have ever known, and it is a privilege to be here. As a staff member of VFW Magazine, I had the good fortune to write about Margo for VFW's Vietnam book. I also had the good fortune to work side by side with its editor, Richard Cobb, for 27 years. Rich is a Vietnam veteran who served with the 4th Infantry Division, then later with the 101st Airborne Division as an artillery RTO. Not being a veteran myself, I learned tremendously from him. In 2003, he started a series celebrating the 40th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War. It ran through to 2016, right into the 50th anniversary of the war. The series covered only the deadliest battles, battles that had the largest loss of American lives. I'm talking about single battles, some just a short time period, less than an hour. The series was meant to recognize, as World War II correspondent Ernie Pyle once said, the men up there doing the dying. But long before 2016, we had already begun laying the groundwork to combine the series into a book, Brutal Battles of Vietnam. It turned out to be a monumental 480-page work covering nearly 100 deadly actions. We were fortunate to have VFW's backing to produce the book. It fulfills VFW's continuing mission to recognize service and sacrifice. Within the book are battles that are largely gone, that have largely gone unknown, except to those who fought them, like LZ Margo. That is not to slight the more well-known battles that have become <coughs> synonymous with Vietnam, like Way, Khe San, Hamburger Hill, and I Drang Valley. But above all else, it was important for the battles to be told by the men who were there, the trigger pullers. And by doing so, these battles live on in your words, your actions, and your roles. And that is what makes this book different from most others. And I want to mention here a great web tool we use to ensure accuracy, the Koffelt database. Richard Koffelt, a Korean War era veteran, created an extensive database of all the KIAs of Vietnam he had help, though, from a number of very dedicated Vietnam veterans, particularly Ken Davis. Overall, their work was indispensable, and here's why. Because of the database, we could accurately reconstruct which units participated in the battles so that none were left out. For a battle to be included in VFW's book, the number of KIAs had to fall at roughly 30 or more up through 1968. From 1969 on, when the fighting diminished somewhat, that number went down to 20. Elsie Margo fell right at the cusp. So I had to know what happened on that landing zone. Now the Marine Corps history on Vietnam for 1968 devoted one, counted one paragraph on LZ Margo. I ran across that passage while doing research on another battle, and I was shocked to see it had so little attention. 
I first dug into the internet and came across General Jarvis Lynch's account, The Dead Went Last, which I'm sure many of you have read. General, I want you to know how gold, that when I found that, I knew how gold prospectors felt when they discovered a rich vein of gold. Mm -hmm. There it all was. Here is what happened. Next, I found James Anton's account that he'd written to his daughter, Kelly Anton Dilly, about his time on Margo with Echo Company. Then I found the 81 Mortar Platoon's website, also rich with information. I even posted a notice on weathernet.com and heard from more people. At some point, I heard from Larry McCartney, and he assured me he knew others who could help tell the story. And soon, I had more personal accounts than I imagined possible. Now, before I go further, I just want to thank everyone that I interviewed or corresponded with, and also apologize if your material was not used. I was simply handcuffed by space limitations. So some things didn't make it in the book. Here are a few things I had to exclude. For instance, Monsignor John Cregan, Captain Cregan, talked of 20-year-old James C. Durham, nicknamed Bull Durham. He was a machine gunner on point the night of September 15th, the night before the mortar barrage. It had been raining, and Cregan loaned him his poncho. He also warned Durham if the NVA were coming at them that night, they would be coming through him. Durham replied that if so, they would be in for one hell of a surprise. <laughs> Later after the mortar attack on the 16th, Cregan was at the landing zone on Margo where the dead were lined up, ready for transport. He suddenly spotted his poncho, the one he had given Durham. It had about 50 holes in it and was covering the Marine's body. Another story was from 2nd Lieutenant Corky Haston of Hotel Company. He told me about being upset at his men because they were making too much noise on the way back to Margo on the 16th. Orders were to maintain silence, but his men couldn't. So when they reached Margo, instead of letting them go to the water point and fill their canteens, Corky made them first dig fighting holes. So considering what happened a short time later, maybe that punishment was a life-saving act. Many of you talked how you scrambled to shield yourself from the mortars. Captain Charles Broughton of Hotel Company said he wedged himself between two rocks and pulled a box of 106 recoilless rifle ammo over him. Okay. <laughs> He's still alive. Right. <laughs> Echo Company's first Lieutenant Dale Whitler said the mortar barrage was the moment that he thought he was not going to get out of there alive. He said that all of the incoming fire and people getting hit and screaming was beyond belief. Corporal Jeff Wilson, also of Echo Company, talked about how he and another Marine sought shelter on the side of a log. On the other side were two other Marines. For some unknown reason, at one point during the attack, the two pairs switched sides of the log. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Ultimately, two of them were hit. One along the spine and couldn't move. The other was hit in the face, as well as the arm, where the shrapnel tore into the tattoo of a boxer, tearing its face away. Mike Carroll of Hotel Company cheated when digging a, a fighting hole. As you all know, the ground there was hard rock. But he had found a punji pit, so he just dug it out deeper. But in doing so, he cut his hand on one of the punji sticks. After he had it bandaged, he returned just as the motor attack started. So he dove into his pit, and another Marine jumped on top of him. The two rode out the barrage until that Marine was hit. 
but fortunately he was wearing a flak jacket and only had his arms torn up. Bob Sullivan of Golf Company had been writing a letter to his girlfriend, Peggy, when he heard the whoop whoop sound of mortars. He rolled into his hole and rode out the rounds falling all around him, thinking that this may be the end. Kerry Copper of Foxtrot Company said he and a few others were around their fighting holes eating sea rations and playing cards. He said it was a sunny day and he was feeling good because he had re just received new boots. Then he heard the mortars going off and they all jumped into their holes. Copper's hole, however, had a little water in it and his new boots became encased in the <coughs> orange mucky mud at which he just had to laugh. Fortunately, his area of Margot was hit the least. Now, I will never forget the stress in Dave Hunt's voice when he told me that September 16th was the day he should have died. He related details about the ground attack that came on the heels of the mortar barrage. He came face to face with an NBA soldier charging right at him. I asked him, what did you do? Dave replied, I killed him. <laughs> At one point in the interview, we had to stop because the process of remembering was too painful for him. Mike Schott, a close friend of Dave's, wrote me last year saying that Dave had passed away suddenly. He added, though, that Dave had received his book just a few weeks before and was ecstatic about it, telling family and friends, look, here's what I went through in Vietnam. As if dodging enemy mortars was not enough, Caven Cox of the recon platoon remembers a puffed gunship sweeping the front of their lines where he was on the evening of the 16th. Puff's guns put five rounds in a poncho behind him, cracked a rock near his head, and drilled a hole in his buddy's canteen. After all that had happened that day, he was nearly a casualty of friendly fire. Maybe some of you can relate to what Lieutenant Kent Wonders went through. He wrote of how Sergeant Hill approached him after the mortar barrage, <coughs> carrying Corporal Rodney Bradford limp in his arms. Wonders said he had known Bradford well, remembered him alone, and even disciplined him. But he knew that now he was gone. Wonder said that the scene on Margo that day left no time to say goodbye, a regret that I'm sure many of you felt that day. <coughs> Corporal Bruce Pilch told me that sometime after Margo, he received new clothes. He bundled up the old ones that he'd worn and shipped them home. They were complete with all the holes and some shrapnel still embedded. But being a good son, he also included a letter for his mother so she wouldn't get too upset. <laughs> Pete Post of Golf Company summed it all up by saying, we were kind of like goldfish in a pond. Pete was one of the lucky ones on Margot that day, surviving without a scratch. In fact, for the entire 13 months he spent with a rifle company in Vietnam, he was never wounded. Now I owe Larry McCartney an apology. In his account, I referred to him as a sergeant, when actually he was a PFC at the time. My mistake totally, Larry. <laughs> Let's just say that in the flurry of writing, I gave you a battlefield. <laughs> 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 I sincerely hope that because of all your personal stories and written accounts in VFW's book, the story of Elsie Margo will never be forgotten. I can also assure you that more than 12,000 people who have bought the book to date now also know about Elsie Margo. So it's hard to imagine that anything positive came out of it all. I did run across an after action summary that said because of what happened at Margo, Marine Corps procedures in the future should be flexible with safety margins during arc-like bombings with regard to the potential dangers of the tactical situation in the field. 
It's kind of a mouthful, <coughs> but the key word here is flexible. So maybe one could assume that lives later on were saved. For the sake of those who were killed during those two days, we can only hope so. Now I want to end with one last thing I learned about writing about this battle. John Cregan ended his interview by telling me, and I quote, Margot defined us. It bonded us together for the rest of our lives. <clears throat> now I know a number of you have kept in touch over the years, even calling each other on September 16th. That kind of camaraderie speaks volumes about you. It speaks to that unbreakable bond as hard as steel forged in combat. Brothers in the field, always faithful. A bond that began 50 years ago and brought all of you here this weekend. Other people may not fully understand it because only you know how important it is today as it was then. Thank you. That was, that was really, really terrific. I really appreciate it. Before Steve comes up, we come from a bunch that came home to nobody giving a damn. And it is overdue and really appreciated when somebody that wasn't with us looks at us and says, you guys did good. So thank you.